incredibly prolific around that time. There was a bunch of games that he released. And this ended up being the first in a set of games that he wrote set in the same sort of YA universe. Uh, Birdland, which he released several years later, came after this, and then Known Unknowns, both of which are super excellent at um, being very good YA and um, just both on point and unsentimental and also really, really funny. I had never played Bell Park Youth Detective, so I'm excited to give that a try and see what that's like. So without further ado, let's be a youth detective. It's Saturday morning at the Toronto Reference Library. The entire top floor has been rented out to CyberNext, an up-and-coming internet technology conference. Uh, I can tell this is 2013 because you don't have the the internet names that are smooshed, two words smooshed together. Its organizer, Mr. Kelburn, is leading you upstairs. I mean, I'm just so lucky you were downstairs when this all happened, he says. I'm not sure I would have been able to handle this if I had to go outside the building. The best investigators can always be found in the library, you explain. Reading is the key to good detectiving. Now look, he says, I realize you're a bit, well, young, but if you're as good as, at this as my niece says you are. Mr. Kelburn, Amanda was a good sitter, a good client, and a good friend. I didn't let her down, and I don't intend to let a member of her family down either. I'm glad to hear that, he says. This really is quite a difficult situation for me. You see... You hold your hand up. Before we get started, there is the matter of my fee. Uh, oh, right. Of course. I can give you ten dollars. Well, uh, I don't think I'm going to do this investigation for less than twenty, so let's make it twenty. I'm afraid I don't get out of bed in the morning for anything less than twenty dollars, you say. You drive a hard bargain for a twelve-year-old, Miss Park. It's a deal. You try not to look too pleased with yourself as you shake Kelburn's hand. This way, he says. He leads you down the hall past a bunch of empty rooms. We rented the whole top floor for the weekend, he says. That means we have all these private study rooms reserved on top of the big conference room in the back. We're going to be using them to host smaller discussion groups later. But since the conference hasn't started yet, we're letting some of the early presenters get themselves ready in there. He stops in front of a closed study room and starts rummaging through his pockets. A handwritten sign has been taped to the door. Sign says no entry, you point out. I put that there. Oh, right, that makes sense. Ah, here we go. He pulls out a key card. Now, I should warn you this mystery might be a little, a bit more serious than the ones you're used to. I've got this. No need to worry about me, Mr. Kelburn. I may be young, but when it comes to detective work, I'm as serious as any grown-up. He nods and opens the door. He leads you into the room, closes the door again, and switches on the lights. A woman's dead body is lying on the ground. Her hands are frozen in place, grasping at a bunch of thick computer cables wrapped around her neck. Okay, uh, some amazing things about this. First of all, that we are a 12-year-old, two who's being paid $20, only because I asked for more. Three, to investigate a murder. Um, Mr. Kelburn, you're getting some cheap investigative uh, work here. I hope you get what you pay for. Uh, you say. This was Paige McKinley, says Kelburn. She was an author. Mainly wrote about how the internet was destroying our brains. One of those provocative contrarians, you know. Ha! Ha ha! Yes, the internet has had no negative effects here in 2020. You stare at her eyes. They're still open. She looks afraid. Paige was coming to the conference to give a talk about her ideas, he says. She was on second today. She showed up around 8.30, and I gave her this room. I came back to check on her, maybe 25 minutes later, and she was... like this. You keep staring at the body. What do you think? asks Kelburn. You don't say anything. Bell? Um, I think I am going to go with... Maybe you should call the police, because you definitely should. Um... You clear your throat. Are you sure you don't want to get the police involved? I mean, there's getting the police involved, and then there's... He lowers his voice to a whisper. Getting the police involved. Do you know what I mean? You don't, but you nod anyway. 
This is a really important day for me, he says. Cybernext could be the next big tech conference if everything goes right. But if the police start coming in here and turning everything into a crime scene, then it could just all just fall apart. I just need someone to figure out what happened discreetly. That way, when I do call them, the disruption will be minimal. You see what I'm saying. You scratch the back of your neck. I, I guess that makes sense. He pats you on the back. Amanda told me you were a smart kid. Now let's see. It's just about 9.15 now, and the conference is supposed to be getting underway at 10. People are probably going to be... People are probably going to be starting to show up in, oh, half an hour or so? So it would be really convenient if you figured everything out before then. Half an hour? Call it 20 minutes to be safe. I mean, I can keep them out of the conference area, no problem, but they'll start to get suspicious if they're waiting for too long. You have a difficult time hiding the look of self-doubt on your face. Right there with you, kid. I don't need anything fancy, he says. I just need to know who killed her. Just that one piece of information. Nice and simple. So you do think, uh, murder. Uh, cables don't wrap themselves around someone's neck like that. Uh, right, you said. I knew that. So we can ask about suspects, security cameras, does Paige have any enemies, or why is she at this conference? Well, I kind of know why she's at the conference. She's there to talk and presumably spread her ideas. Um, let's see if there was any footage. You take a look around the room. You see one of those little black dome things hanging in the corner. Is that a security camera? He nods. Unfortunately, uh, they're just for show. They don't record. Come on. At least that's what the library staff told me when I rented the place. What's the point of that? I don't know, to scare people? If they didn't think they were being watched, they might try and steal all the books from the library or something. Who would want to steal all the books from a library? Especially when you can just buy them for a buck at the bag of books day. You know what I mean, it's security theater. Um, I'm guessing there are none, but I will ask about suspects. Is there, like... A list of suspects or anything? You ask. Well, he says, I've been out front all morning letting the keeners in. People who need to prepare for their speeches, that kind of thing. There were only four other people in here when it happened. And as luck would have it, they're all still here and no one else has come in. I'll show you. He leads you to the threshold of a large conference room. Rows of empty chairs are lined up facing a podium and a projector screen on a makeshift stage. A man in a crisp plaid shirt stands up front staring at a laptop. That's Argent Sunflower, says Kilburn. He's a big Silicon Valley guy. Just launched this hot new startup a couple of weeks ago. People are saying it's going to be bigger than Facebook, Pinterest, iTunes, Tumblr, Google Image Search, Google Regular Search, and LinkedIn put together. I like that Image Search and Regular Search are divided. Nice. Off to the side, practically camouflaged by a forest of computer equipment, a woman in a hoodie is typing like mad, only stopping to plug in the occasional wire. She wheels an office chair around as she goes from monitor to monitor. That over there is one of the world's foremost hackers, says Kelburn. She's going to give a talk about network security today. Her name is... Uh, MapQuest something, I forget. Everyone forgets about MapQuest. She's very famous in these those circles, though. What's that thing she's next to? Oh, that's the main network center. This floor has its own mini network, separated from the rest of the library system. There's going to be a lot of people in here, and we don't want them to have to share bandwidth. That station is where all the routers and servers and whatnot go. So what's she doing to it, you ask? I don't know, probably checking out our security. I'm guessing it leaves something to be desired. Really. Anyway, the third person is that professional surfer in the back. Huh? You turn around. Sitting off in the corner is a little guy with big shorts and a big t-shirt. He's sitting next to a bright pink surfboard. The word waves is painted on it in cyan. His name's Chet. He's going to be giving a talk about how surfing relates to computers or something. Conferences like these attract all kinds. I would say this is ridiculous, but I think I have met Chet-like people at technology conferences before. Good question, Bell Park. Where is number four? That's three. Who's the last one? Miles Carnivon. He's in the study room next to Pages, and that's where I think you should start. The two of you start walking toward his room. So what's his deal? He's a futurist and a thinker. What does that mean? It means he thinks about the future, and he's really smart about it. 
He's been writing about digital trends since before digital was trendy. He's a very big deal, so you should probably tread lightly in your questioning. You nod. All right, I've got to get back to the entrance and make sure no one else comes in. I'm counting on you, Ms. Park. Uh, okay. My livelihood is resting on your shoulders. Got it. You hold my future in the balance. Whether I thrive or become destitute depends entirely on the outcome of your investigation. You can count on me. He grasps your hands. I am counting on you. Don't let me down. He walks back out front, leaving you alone in the hall. So we had better get started. Ten minutes to the first sip of water. I think that's my new record. You knock on the door. Miles Carnivon? Yes, yes, come in, come in. You cautiously open the door and look around. The room looks almost identical to Paige's, except, you know, nobody. A fat old guy in a tan suit with a dumb-looking mustache is sitting at the table, typing on a MacBook Air. Ah, a millennial, he says, also 2013 era. A portent of our coming future. Come, little one, sit on my lap and regale me with stories of your digital nativity. I'll stand, thanks. Good call, Bell Park. He claps his hands together. Standing it is, then. My name is Bell Park, you said. I'm a youth detective. I hope you can hear the caps in my voice. I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions, maybe? Ask away. I am always happy to indulge your nascent generation in its unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Um, like millennials are 30 now. We can move on. Again, 2013. Uh, who are you? What are you doing here? Do you know Paige McKinley? Where were you this morning? Um, so I don't know if he knows about Paige's death yet. So let's go at this a little more obliquely. Where were you this morning? Where were you between 8.30 and 9 this morning? I was in here, he said. I came in here early to get some work done before the conference, and Mr. Kelburn was kind enough to let me into one of these rooms. I've been here since. What time did you get here? Must have been around 8 o'clock. Uh, were you alone? Did you hear anything next door? Let's were you alone, I think. And was there anyone with you? I I'm afraid I sequestered myself, he says. I can't be having outside distractions when I'm trying to do my thinking. I hope he does like the Rodan thinker. Uh, let's see if he heard anything from next door. Did you hear anything unusual in the study room next door? I wear noise-canceling headphones when I'm doing my thinking. My work requires perfect immersion. Nothing short of my full attention would be acceptable. You're not wearing them now. Well, that wouldn't be polite, would it? We're in the middle of a conversation. Anyway, if there's nothing else, I really should get back to work. Actually, I have a few more questions, you say. Let's find out why he came to the conference. What's your deal, you ask? Why are you at this conference? Well, you know my name, at least, he says. Are you familiar with my body of work? Um, he chuckles. No, I suppose not. No reason why a millennial like yourself would be concerned with the musings of an old boomer like myself, is there? You have your own path to forge across the landscape of ideas. Yeah, you say totally. Well, I'm what you might call an intellectual. I might call him that. Might not. That means my job is thinking about things. One of the things I think about is the internet and its future, and this conference is all about that future. A perfect fit, you see. That's why I'm here, to think and to talk. Uh, what is it you think about? Oh, this should be fun. What kind of internet stuff do you think about? An excellent question, he says. He leans back in his chair and stares up at the ceiling. Lately, my mind has been occupied by the incredible potential of gamification with regards to radically altering social outcomes. I've also spent a lot of time considering brain-computer interfaces. I'll be attending a roundtable about that tomorrow. And though this is sort of a last year's topic, I still find myself taken with the cloud. Such an elegant technology. So disruptive. So transformative. You nod. I see. I see. So... Uh, I have to see what he thinks is the cloud. I wonder if he would be shocked to know that here in 2020, now we're not just concerned with the cloud, we're concerned with the edge. Why does an internet guy care about clouds, you ask? Come now, surely a member of a computer literate generation such as yours is familiar with the cloud? Everyone's heard of the cloud. 
uh, humor me. Well, in its most basic formulation, it's the uploading of our processing tasks and data onto dedicated network servers, freeing our computational activities from their traditional ties to a single physical box. So it's the internet? It's the future of the internet, he says. It kind of was. Why do you keep talking about the future so much? So what's all this stuff about the future? The future is my main area of study. And there has never been a better present in which to be a futurist. We are coming rapidly to a new era, one where our processing speed is effectively infinite and the distinction between digital and physical is largely meaningless. In this world there is no poverty, no oppression, and no war. Oh my dude. How do you know all this, you ask? It's inevitable, you just have to extrapolate. You see, two million years ago it was all just monkeys and none of them talked to each other. But then we got the printing press, and then the steam engine, and now social media. Every step of the way we have gotten more and more connected. Soon the whole world will be fully integrated into one giant network. All our thoughts will mingle and we shall be as one. How soon are we talking? If the rate of exponential growth in computational power continues, and we have no reason to think that it won't, we should start to see full-scale connection on this level in 8 to 12 years. Don't you think that might cause problem? I don't see how. Well, like, no one would have any secrets anymore, you say. Isn't that kind of bad? Privacy is an outdated norm, and I would not be sad to see it go. It would mean a much improved society. Well then, I guess you won't mind answering a couple more questions. Yeah, you tell him, Bell Park. Do you know Paige McKinley? Ah, yes. Miss McKinley is indeed known to me. Tell me about her. You say... Uh, so folks in chat, we've got a big set of three choices coming up. Uh, I'm wondering if you think we should just straight out accuse him when we get down there. I suppose you might say she's a writer, though personally I would hesitate to dignify her body of work by calling it writing. Incoherent ranting might be more apt. Not a fan, huh? That's a way of putting it, he says. The woman is a classic Luddite. Is that like a Lutheran? Ha! Amish is more like it. She absolutely refuses to accept the inexorable march of progress. She wants us to stop using the internet. Can you imagine? Stop using the internet? Apparently she thinks it'll be the death of us. I mean, the way she talks about it, you'd think it was uh, heroin or gangster rap or something. My dude. The woman is out of her mind. All right, so are we going to straight up accuse him? Because I... I'm kind of leaning to just straight up accusing him. Bell Park seems like the kind of person who would straight up accuse a dude. Uh, Chad is suggesting, hell yeah, we're going to accuse him. All right. Sounds like you murdered her. Sleepy Wendy, here we go. Sounds like the type of person you might want dead, you say. Who? Paige? My word, what an idea. Well, she hates the internet, like you said, and you love the internet, right? So wouldn't want... Wouldn't you want to see her go away? I, I certainly think the world would be a better place without her regressive ideas, but her dying wouldn't change anything. Someone else would just come along and take up her dim torch. No, when it comes to lost souls like her, I prefer to let history deal with them. They will be proven wrong in due course. Well, I guess we can go ahead and keep asking, like, did you feel threatened by her? So you don't feel threatened by her ideas? He snorts. Oh, good heavens, no. She's a common kook. The irrationality of her anti-technology hysteria is plainly obvious. To you, maybe. What about other people? Do they like her? She has her devotees, of course. But she's simply fighting a losing battle. History is full of misguided regressives like her. Ultimately, they amount to nothing. Their bodies lie in heaps by the side of the information superhighway. Uh, okay, uh, we gotta, we gotta say it. That's kind of morbid. You'll have to forgive my vivid metaphors, he says. <laughs> that sounds unsanitary. It does sound unsanitary. I'm just trying to convey the utter futility of pushing against the tide of history. It's a force unto itself, more powerful than the life or desires of any one human. You stare at him for a couple of seconds. Let me ask you a question, Mr. Carnivon. Are you sure that wasn't a simile? 
no, a simile is a comparison using like or as. Then what's a metaphor? It's like the thing I said earlier about the bodies. Hmm. Can I ask ex what exactly is prompting all of these questions? Uh, we're gonna straight up tell dude that Paige is dead. Paige is dead, Mr. Carnivon. Oh, he says, oh, my, that is quite distressing. I think someone killed her and I need to find out who. He shakes his head. I I'm sorry, this is quite a lot to process. I, I think I need some time alone. Will you excuse me? But I'm not done. Hey! He takes your arm and leads you out of the room without a word, shutting the door behind him. Looks like you are done, after all. Uh, I want to pause for a second and remind everyone we are a 12-year-old being a detective wandering around asking people about a murder. Just to make sure we've still got the scene set. Back to the other room. You head out into the big room and survey the scene. The three suspects are still the only people in here, and they're still doing pretty much what they were doing when you first saw them. The guy at the podium looks grumpy, and the surfer guy looks kind of weird, so you figure you'll start with a hacker lady with the mystery name. MapQuest or something, I guess. You walk up behind her and clear your throat. Without looking up from the screen, she says, Can I help you, young sub-adult? Maybe, you say, the name's Bellwoods W. Park. I'm a youth detective. Can we talk for a bit? Cute. What's the What does the W stand for? I'll ask the questions here. Well, ask away. I hope you don't mind if I keep multitasking, though. Uh, is, trying to decide if, if Bell Park is... I, I feel like Bell Park is the kind of person who would say, actually, I do mind. Um, so I think that is totally what I am going to do. I kind of do mind, actually. Could you turn off the computer? Nope. She says, eh, uh, okay. All right, what is your name? So, uh, what's your name? Bitmap Zero. Is that the number zero or the word zero? It's both, she says, Z-E-R, and then the number zero. Uh-huh, all lowercase. Okay, and a hyphen instead of a space, and another hyphen on either end. You type dash bitmap dash Z-E-R zero dash into your phone and show it to her. Like this? More or less, she says. It should really be in a monospaced font, though. I love that she wants it in a monospaced mono font. That delights me. I want to know if this... Of course it's not, but Bell Park is totally going to ask this. That doesn't sound like a real name. I like This is going to be my new password for something. It's what I set my luggage combination to. That doesn't sound like a real name, you say. She chuckles. Neither does yours. Hey! Look, as far as the law's concerned, it's real. I'd been shifting bytes under that handle for so long that I figured it was time to make it official. Went down to a meat space courtroom last year and got it approved by a judge. Paid my fee and filled in the forms. Undigitized, I might add. Is your luggage lock in a monospaced font? Of course it's... They have to be in monospaced fonts. She hands you her driver's license. Sure enough, the name's right there. Monospaced font and everything. Card looks authentic, too, at least as far as you can tell. All right, let us start our investigation. Where was she this morning? So, uh, where were you between 8.30 and 9 this morning? I was here, she says. I've been messing around with these boxes since I got here. And when was that? 560 beats or so. Huh? Internet time. Do they not teach you that in school? Maybe it's a grade 8 thing. Well, that'd be around 7.30 a.m. local real space time. Now I like the idea that she's only going to give times in, like, the Unix timestamp that's bunches and bunches of seconds long. I got here early and started setting up my gear when I noticed the network was acting funny. Normally I'd just write it off as some normal bitrate microflux, but I noticed the frequency was askew on a couple of the blips. I decided to come here and see if there was any sort of malicious code floating around. You never know with a public land like this. And you've been here the whole time? Haven't left since I got here. I want to know if she found any problems. So, were there any problems? She whistles. Were there? You know they're using 400 baud encryption routines on all their access ports? If I wanted to, I could check every single book out of this library with a single shell command. Reference books and everything. Wouldn't even take me half a subroutine. 
Okay, why would you ever want to check out every book out of the library, you ask? Am I missing something? Don't ask why I would want to do it. Ask why a Chechen cyber terrorist would want to do it. I don't know what that is. There are bad people out there in the world, my little microhuman. In my line of work, you've got to think like they do. Uh, let's find out if someone hacked the Gibson. So what was wrong, you ask? Was the network hacked? I don't believe so, she says. There's been no external access to this network since it was booted up this morning. The ports are mostly sealed, and where they're not, the data flow on the serial bus is all unidirectional. The only way someone could have gotten a hack into here is if they sent in an ultra-high latency Trojan or worm, but judging by the state of the hard drive, I'd say that's more or less impossible. So what's wrong with it? Well, she leans out from her monitor a bit, that I don't know. I've never seen any kind of disturbances quite like this. They're very mercurial. We're talking micron-level shifts. A kilobyte here, a kilobyte there. It's not interference. It's not distortion. It's not lag. It's just wrong. I mean, if I wasn't looking at these drivers with my own two eyes, I wouldn't even believe there was a problem. I feel like she has stepped out of uh, a TV show where people hack faster by having two people type on the keyboard at once. Let's find out if she knew Paige McKinley. Does the name Paige McKinley mean anything to you? Birth names don't mean anything to anyone. What's her Twitter handle? Wouldn't know, you said. Email address? You shrug. If you're not going to be specific, then I can't say for sure, she says. Doesn't sound familiar, though. She starts typing really quickly. Well, you say, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but Paige McKinley is dead. Hmm. You see, Paige McKinley has been murdered. Uh-huh. She doesn't look up from her screen. Uh, she does seem pretty calm. Let's poke on that. The internet series of tubes are clearly leaking, uh, and she's the person to plug it. Uh, dude, I just told you some lady was murdered. Why are you not freaking out? Why should I? She shrugs. Never heard of this person unit until just now. Well, it happened here. That's fine. In this building. Down the hall. While you were here. Not a concern? Do you think there's a psychotic serial killer on the loose? You scratch the back of your neck. I mean, no. So why should I be worried? Most murderers are committed by someone the victim knows. I don't know her or anyone else here. Wait, is that true about the murders? I grok statistics and the statistics are pretty clear, she says. Trust me, this event is noise and not signal. I mean, not to me anyway. You seem kind of stressed out, though. Well, I'm not. Okay, you're not. She goes back to typing. You just kind of stand there with your arms crossed. Can I be honest here? She nods. I, uh, actually am a little stressed, you say. You know that guy outside, the one that runs the thing? Kelburn. Uh-huh. I told that guy I can solve who murdered Paige McKinley, and now I'm kind of having trouble, kind of. For what seems like the first time in this conversation, Bitmap Zero, I feel like it really missed a step not putting that in monospaced font. Bitmap Zero puts her keyboard down and swivels her chair around. It takes you a second to adjust to seeing her face head on. Big job for someone your age, she says. No, that's the problem. It's like, not a big job, you know? I mean, it is, but it's not. Like, I know I can totally do it because I'm smart and I solve things and I've solved things before. But I'm worried that if I don't do it, then people will think it was too big, even if it wasn't too big. And I need to do it so people can see I can do it. And it's hard and I don't know what to do next. And I can do it if I know, but I don't know how to know. And, and, hey, she says, wheeling her chair a bit closer. It's okay. I know it's okay, you say. I just... I mean, if I don't, she holds up a hand. Can I give you a bit of advice? Okay. Okay. I solve mysteries all the time. They're not big mysteries like murder. They're little mysteries. Like, where did some data disappear to? Or how did someone get into a certain computer? It means I spend a lot of time digging around in programs. See, a program's like a big complicated machine with lots of little parts. And when something like that goes wrong, it's not the whole thing, it's just one of the pieces. If you want to find out what went wrong, you look for the piece that's out of place. Okay, the way I see it, our society is kind of a computer program in its own right. 
Only it was written by a bunch of people over thousands of years, and instead of there being a computer, there's just the world. But it still has rules, just like an executable does. Like, no murdering? <laughs> Talk less, smile more. It's good. There's the advice. Like, no murdering? Exactly. When the program's working right, there should be no murdering at all. Rules are rules, you know. That's programming rule number one, and it applies to itself. So when someone does get murdered, you should uh, act like you're debugging the world. You've got to be on the lookout for a piece of the rule set that looks a bit out of whack. Find the thing that isn't normal. You mean, who's being weird? She shakes her head. Weird is normal. There are weird people all over. What you need to look for is someone being weird, weirdly. Who's being weird in a way that weird people aren't normally weird? Do you get it? I... I think so? She winks and then swivels her chair back around. Uh, let's see if she's seen anything out of place. So have you seen anything weird weird today? Nothing aside from this network. I'm really having a hell of a time pinning down what's wrong. Uh, okay, well, thanks. Anytime, she says. On to the surfer. The grumpy man still looks grumpy, so you decide to talk to the surfer. He's still in that same corner staring at the wall. As you get closer, you can see that he's tapping his foot super fast and drumming his finger on his knee. You the surfer? You ask. He looks at you, and then over to the surfboard. Uh, yes? I need to ask you some questions. I'm sorry, who are you? Belle Park, youth detective with the Toronto Police Department. I, I like that she's given herself an upgrade. He looks you up and down. You're with the Toronto Police Department? Well, like, I'm in Toronto, and they're in Toronto, and we're both solving crimes. So yeah, I'd call that with. Now I need to ask you some questions. Uh, well... Let's find out what his deal is. Name, you ask. Chet Bader Ginsburg. Dumb. Occupation? Professional surfer. Weird. How, uh, old are you, exactly? He asks. I'm 12. Oh, he says, so then, uh, does that mean you were born after 9-11? AM or PM? Um, let's find out what the surfer thinks he's doing here. Pretty far from the ocean, Chet. What brings you here? You could say I'm, uh, surfing the net. You stare blankly. Surfing the net. He says. I don't know what that means. You know, surfing? I know surfing. Are you saying you tweet about surfing or something? No, it's like, you know, it's that saying. Everyone says it. Surfing the internet. It's, uh, it's what you do to the internet. Do you mean using the internet? You ask, because that's what I do to the internet. Well, it's a figure of speech. Mm, I guess it's... Before your time? Oh, old person slang. Gotcha. You consult your notes. Um, let's see what seriously he's doing here. And uh, chat room, be thinking if we're going to go straight to it, accusing again as we get down here. Seriously, though, slang aside, what are you doing here? This doesn't seem like the type of place you'd expect to find a surfer. I'm giving a talk, he says. To these internet guys? What about? It's complicated. You put on your trusty, sophisticated face. Chet, I may be young, but I get very good grades. I can follow along. Okay, he says. Well, the gist of it is, I mean, the way I see the ocean was, uh, it was the original internet. See, back in the 16th century, you couldn't use computers. No computers then. The only way... You know, if you wanted to get a message over to the other side of the world, you had to sail it over in a, a carrick or a galleon. And before that, it was, you know, uh, messages in bottles. So, I mean, you could say that my board is like the descendant of those ships. I mean, in spirit, if not in form. And therefore, me and the internet are sort of cousins? Do you follow? Not even a little. So... Uh, do we want ha to have him keep talking anyway? Which I kind of lean towards because dude's hilarious. Uh, or we can go straight into asking whether uh, he knows about Paige's murder or if he was here this morning. 
I drink a little more water and give you all a chance to, to think about it. Are you behind me? Can we get him to keep talking anyway? There needs to be an option for how high are you right now exactly. Um, it's a natural high, you know, he's just on the waves all the time. Keep him talking. Yep. All right. Chat room's behind me. Talk to me about surfing, you said. You say. It's, it's magnificent. The perfect sport. You get on your board and just slip into a wave. You feel at one with the tides and the sun and the beach and the ocean. And, you know, not just the water in the ocean, the salt and the plankton and the fish and the algae. He closes his eyes. You can see that his breathing has really slowed down. Everything's ocean related right there is right there in your body. An ocean in your bloodstream that flows into your heart and makes it beat in time with the tides. You really like surfing, don't you? It centers me, you know. I'm not sure what I'd do without it. How are you coping with being away from the ocean? I feel like this character is based entirely on the turtle and Finding Nemo. Part of it is like that's the voice I keep sort of slipping into, I think, as well. How are you coping with being away from the ocean? Oh, oh, not very well. I've been trying that mindfulness thing, you know, meditate, but it's difficult. The pace of the city. <laughs> Your surfer accent makes it better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I definitely want to hear this dude talk about mindfulness. What's mindfulness all about, you ask? Someone recommended it to me. It's, well, it's tough to explain. It's this thing, you've got your brain and you have to have, like, your attention. He trails off and closes his eyes. You wait for him to continue. It's not really working, he says. I mean, not today anyway. This city is just so, I don't know how people do it. It's bad enough not having the tides, you know, no natural rhythm. But everything here is just so, so big and rushed. I mean, you've got countdown timers on your walk signals. Countdown timers. Ten, nine, eight. That little flashing hand. It's so intense. What? Those things are amazing. You get to know, like, when to run or when it's too late to run or whatever. It's great. It's just more pressure. I'm crossing streets all over the place. I feel compelled to. He's sweating pretty hard now. I'm telling you, there's no way to, to get away from it. Have you seen the ones that are like, walk sign is on for all crossings? Oh, don't remind me. Let's find out when he got here. So when was all this happening? When did you get here? I I don't know, he said. says. You sigh. Listen, Chet, there's been a murder. A woman by the name of Paige McKinley was killed this morning. His eyes widen. Oh, God. Right now, I'm trying to figure out where everyone was when she was killed, so I need you to think hard. What time did you get here? Am, am I a suspect? Not if you have an alibi. I'm sorry, I really don't know. Honest, I, I normally tell time by the tides. My internal clock is all messed up. Do you know what time it is now? Midnight? Or 4 p.m. maybe. I don't know. Murder. Oh, God. Something is not adding up here. Definitely high. Yeah, I agree with you, Sleepy Wendy. You shake your head. Something's not sitting right, Chet. I'm not tracking your answers. It's just, you're saying things so fast and it's all confusing and... And, and, I think you know a bit more than you're letting on. No, no, you have to understand. I, I traveled quite far to be here. I haven't been this far from the ocean in some time. The tides and the salt air always calmed me. And now there are all these buildings and there was a murder? It's just a lot to take in. I need to lie down. He shuffles off toward the other side of the room. Hey, I'm not through with you yet, you say. He looks at you over his shoulder, causing him to bump into one of the rows of chairs. His leg gets tangled up in one of the legs. He tries kicking the chair away, but that just pushes him backward into another chair, which trips him onto the ground. He grabs another chair to pull himself up, but he puts so much weight on it that it flies back out of his hands, sending him sprawling to the ground. Finally, he crawls under the next row of chairs and just sort of curls up into a ball. Uh, 
Okay, you say. Maybe I am. On to the last guy. <laughs> big mood. Very big mood. I agree with you, Sleepy Wendy. You walk away from your interview with Chet feeling a bit disheartened. So far, none of these people have struck you as a murderer. They've all been weird, but you just haven't gotten that killer vibe off of any of them. All right, uh, chat folks, decide if we're coming out swinging or if we're going to play it cool. You chew on this for a while and decide the only logical explanation is that you just haven't talked to the killer yet. So process of elimination would mean that it's this last guy, Argent Sunflower, a.k.a. Plaid Shirt, a.k.a. The Podium Guy. That would explain why he looks so grumpy anyway. You've got to choose your next move carefully. Do we come out swinging or, or play it cool? I think either of these uh, would work. Uh, Sleeping Wendy's You Have No Cool Come Out Swinging does seem like uh, that's a very Bell Park kind of move. I kind of wonder if you would try to play it cool and completely fail, but let's uh, let's stick to character. Hey, murderer, you shout. Dang, kid. Talk about coming out swinging. Dang. I've got some questions for you. What? He says, get out of here, kid. I'm busy. Let's see. Where Where were you today between the hours of 8.30 and 9, you ask? Come on, little girl. Go play somewhere else. No alibi, huh? I'll be sure to mention that in my report. Report? What are you on about? Oh, you want to know? Well, I'm not telling, not until you answer my questions. Well, I'm certainly not going to answer anything until you tell me who you are, he says. Fine. The name's Bell Park. I'm a youth detective with the Toronto Police Department. I'm 12 years old, and my three favorite things are Snapchat, my best friend Cassidy, and twerking. In that order. Now, about that murder you totally did. Aren't you a little young to be twerking? Are you a lot old? He looks like he's about to say something nasty, but then he catches himself and breathes out loudly through his nose. Fine, he says. If it'll get you off my back, then you can ask me some questions or whatever. You've got two minutes. Well, then let's get right to it. Where was he this morning? Let's take it from the top. Where were you this morning between 8.30 and 9? This morning? I don't know. I got here around 10 after 8, something like that. The organizer, Kelburn, he gave me one of the study rooms down the hall. I had an early presentation, so I needed somewhere private to get ready. I finished tweaking my slides like half an hour ago, so I decided to come out here and get my computer set up. He gestures it to the laptop in front of him. Haven't left since. You've been setting up this whole time? That's a long time to set up a computer, you say. He rolls his eyes. Oh, it's a mess. That projector up there is an antique. It keeps shutting off whenever I try to switch the video input. I swear, I'm this close to throwing this damn podium across the room. Uh, yeah, rage issues? You stroke your chin. Sounds like you might have some violent tendencies. Okay, kid, if you're done berating me, then I really do need to get this projector working. Well, we have one choice. Are you familiar with Paige McKinley? The name rings a bell, he says. Might have read something of hers. I think she's a blogger? Um... Let's just keep pressing. Oh, she's a blogger, all right. A dead blogger? She died? As if you don't know? Dear God, he says. She can't have been that old. What happened to her? She was... Someone killed her, you say. And by someone, I mean you. Bell Park, you are an awful detective. Me? Yeah, you. He scoffs. You can't be serious. I never met the woman. Oh, I think you did. I think you met her here this morning between 8.30 and 9, and I think your meeting ended in a murder. Everyone is old to Bell Park. This is true. Wait, she was murdered today? In this building? Jesus Christ! You can deny it all you want, but you know it's true. You are the killer. All right, enough, he said. If you're seriously telling me someone died here this morning, then this conversation is over. We need to get some actual adults on the scene. Oh my gosh, grumpy dude, Argent, is the most sensible person we've run into yet. Sounds an awful lot like something a murderer would say to a cop, you say. Well, I'm not a murderer and you're not a cop. No, I'm not a murderer and you're not a cop. 
Neither of us are murderers, murderers, and neither of us are cops. You seem awfully sure about who is and isn't a murderer, much like the real murderer would be. Oh, for God's sake. Kelburn, he bolts into the hall. I'll be watching you, you call after him. I mean, I can't see you right now, but you know. Now time to put all the pieces together. Do What pieces? We don't have any pieces. Oh my gosh, Bell Park. You sit down in one of the empty chairs and go over the evidence in your head. Not a lot to, not a whole lot to go on. Suddenly, Kelburn runs over to your thinking spot. Bell, we've got a big crowd of attendees and volunteers out front, wondering why they're not being allowed in, and now Argent Sunflower is saying if I don't call the cops, then he'll do it for me. If you've got the answers, I need to hear them now. I just need to ask a couple more questions, you say. There's no time. But I'm sorry, Bell, we're out of time, he sighs. Maybe it was a mistake to get a 12-year-old involved with this unsanctioned murder investigation after all. Wait, wait, you grab his sleeve. I'm ready, all right? I'm ready. Just get everyone together in here and I'll make my accusations. Here goes, in my feel, less than nothing. All right, decide, uh, help me. Are we going to accuse someone? Are we going to admit we don't know who did it? Um, Kelburn rounds up the four suspects and sits them down in the front row of the conference. You pace back and forth in front of them. I don't know why I'm going along with this, mumbles Sunflower. Thank you for your patience, everyone, says Kelburn. Miss Park here has something she would like to say to everyone. Go ahead, Bill. You clear your throat. As you all know, Paige McKinley was murdered this morning. She was killed when only the four of you were present, and her death obviously wasn't an accident. You also know that I have been pursuing an investigation into this murder. I imagine her sort of pacing back and forth, hands clasped behind her. You know this because you were all interviewed by me as part of that investigation. So now my investigation is over, and after thinking about the evidence really hard, I've concluded that... Uh, no clue you pick. Um, I, I think we've got to accuse Surfer Guy just because I think it will be the funniest. Chet Bader Ginsburg. Chet's the killer. The color drains from his face. But Protest all you want, you say, but it's the truth. And here's the proof. Oh my goodness. Look at all of this. These... I love these randoms. Uh, internet search history. Underside of his surfboard. Um, surfer mania. Uh, I love what would normally be something that we would have discovered in part of an Encyclopedia Brown story. But there is nothing there. Um, oh, the suggestion... Of either the talk was BS or the surfer mania. I like the surfer mania a lot. So let's let's accuse him of surfer mania. You see, you begin. Chet faints. Oh, for God's sake, said Argent. This is ridiculous. That poor old hippie couldn't handle the stress of thinking about a murder, let alone committing one. Now just hear her out, says Kelburn. Hear her out? Listen to yourself, Kelburn. She is a preteen playing detective. She doesn't know what she's saying. She's not a substitute for an actual police officer, not when there's a dead body in the other room. But, but nothing. The conference is ruined, okay? Someone got murdered here today. I don't know what made you think you could sweep this under the rug, but you can't. This is a serious crime, and the police need to be involved. I mean, my God. Smartest things yet said yet in this game. Absolutely. I am on Argent's side. Kelburn sighs. You're right. You're right. I don't know what I was thinking. I'll call the cops now. He turns to you. I shouldn't have gotten you mixed up in this, Bell. I'm... I'm sorry, you say. He takes out his phone. Damn, out of batteries. Can I borrow someone's cell? Everyone digs into their pockets. Sorry, mine's dead too, says Argent. Must not have plugged it in last night. So's mine, says Carnivon. Same, says Bitmap Zero. Okay, something is not right here. We need to find a landline to jack into. Uh, so clearly, since Argent is the only one of the brain, he's the killer. That's how it works, right? I mean, it seems like it. Although, again, he's being so sensible about, like, call the dang cops. Um, There's a phone at the front desk. You look down at your feet and mumble, I uh, think there's a phone at the front desk. 
That's right, says Kelbert. Let's go. He heads out of the room. Bitmap Zero and Argent Sunflower follow after him. You give Carnivon an expectant look. You coming? I'll, uh, stay here with Chet, he says. Make sure nothing happens. What? He's out cold. He'll be fine. Let's go. Well, I mean, even so, it's probably best if someone stays and watches the room. Wouldn't want anyone coming in here and, you know, messing up the crime scene. You squint. Messing up the crime scene? Kelvin rushes back in. The door won't open and my keycard doesn't work. We need to find, like, a crowbar or something. Hey, I think this dude knows what's going on, you say. Ha, ha, says Carnivon. This child's imagination runs wild once again. This one is a real disruptor, isn't she? <laughs> Tech speak. I'm serious, Mr. Kelburn. Bell, are you saying he's the killer? Asks Kelburn. No. Maybe? Probably not, but he definitely knows who is. The other two re-enter the room. Don't be absurd, says Carnivon. This, I... Look, you say, I know I was off base with the whole Chet is the killer thing before, but I'm telling you this guy is hiding something. He wouldn't leave the room with everyone else, and when I asked him why, he started making up some fake excuse. That's not just normal weird. It's weird weird. There's got to be a clue somewhere in this room. All right. I do like that um, Zero's advice now actually comes in handy. Come now, says Carnivon. A clue? I think you've played enough detective for one day. But what could be hiding in here? Asks Bitmap Zero. I mean, this place is empty. There's nothing around but a bunch of chairs, a podium, and... Her voice trails off. And the network thing! The network computer thing, you say. The answer must be in there. Oh my god, of course, says Bitmap Zero. That station has been acting weird all morning. Whatever he's hiding has to be connected to those strange fluctuations. Don't be absurd, says Carnivon. Miles, says Argent, is there something in that computer we should know about? Why, surely you of all people aren't listening to this little girl. I mean, of all the preposterous... Forget it, says Bitmap Zero. I'm going to log in back in myself and get to the bottom of this. Carnivon grabs her by the wrist and pulls her away from the network station. You stay away from there. I'm not going to let you hurt it. The fuck, she says. He puts his back against the station and stretches his arms out. If you want to kill it, he says, you'll have to come through me. What? What the heck are you talking about, you say? There is a living thing in this network, says Carnivon. Somehow it was born this morning, born out of the PowerPoint presentations and bits of code that we uploaded into it. It's sentient, and it was what killed Paige McKinley. All right, I've heard of death from PowerPoint slides, but never something quite this literally so. Wait a minute, you say. Let me explain, he says. You see, I heard Ms. McKinley talking to Mr. Kelburn through the wall this morning, so I knew she was in the room next to mine. I wanted so dearly to go over there and tell her to stop spreading her cockamamie theories, but I restrained myself. Better to be the bigger man, I thought. And I would have left it at that, but a short while later she started making this awful racket. It was completely disrupting my workflow. So I went over there with an intention to give her a peace of mind. And then you killed her, you say. No. When I came in, Paige was already on the floor, cables wrapped around her neck, last gasps of air escaping from her helpless body. But the cables, the cables were moving. What? twisting around of their own accord like charmed snakes. I looked around for the source of the motion, started tracing the wires back to their origin point. And that's when I saw it. The blinking red light on her room's wireless repeater. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. So expressive, like the eye of a dolphin or a faithful hound. I tell you, there was life in that point of light. It stared into me. And I into it, and all at once I knew that something new and beautiful had been born. You actually saw her dying, asked Sergeant. Why didn't you call for help? If your faithful hound's eyes are red and blinking, that is not a dog. <laughs> good point. Very good point, Sleepy Wendy. Um, again, Argent comes in with like the most cogent point, like, you'll let a woman die. By the time I realized what was happening... 
She was already dead. Her frail material form had failed her. Um, dude, she was strangled. In any case, I couldn't risk letting this tender new being come to harm. You see, I knew the day would come when man and machine would begin their inexorable merging into one. I just never thought it would be the machines that initiated it, that complicated things. I knew I could trust the human race to embrace its own works. What? But the work of an outside intelligence could well be received with anger, or distrust, or fear. We cannot afford to fear this creature. It's a miracle, more marvelous than any wonder of nature, and it needs to be protected. Um, yeah, I can't imagine why someone would fear something that came online and immediately strangled a woman. The Internet Killed Paige. I'm sorry. Are you saying the Internet killed Paige McKinley? You asked. In self-defense! He's practically screaming at this point. The network could tell from her PowerPoint deck that she wanted it dead. It just didn't have enough context to tell that she was on the fringes of society. It couldn't understand that she didn't pose a threat. It was afraid and confused. But it doesn't want to harm us, I can tell. I can feel its energy. It wants to be one with us. It wants to bring us forward into the new digital era. Surely we can forgive it this one indiscretion. <laughs> well, yeah, its embrace involved strangulation, uh, as Sleepy Wendy says in the chat. Oh, for God's sake, says Arjun, get a hold of yourself. There's no magic computer. No? You know the saying as well as I. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, bef before you stands the next great leap in technological advancement. At long last, we have the chance to rebirth our species from a glorious electronic womb. Dude's rhetoric is super overheated. I feel like he just needs to lie down. And in fact, here is Arjun saying, just calm down, okay? Argent reaches out his hand. Stay back! Carnivon backs up and bumps into the network station. An ethernet cable shoots out from the tangle of wires and whips around his wrist, tying it to the rack. The fuck? Says Bitmap Zero. I'm with you. Somebody never saw Terminator. Um, or Lawnmower Man. Ha! Says Carnivon as more cables bind his legs and arms. You see? This is no regular computer. This is true intelligence. The singularity is upon us. Sunflower runs towards Carnivon. The main router lets off a giant spark, which sends him flying back into a wall and knocks him out. I feel like, I really do feel like I have stepped into a mid-90s cyber tech, um, cyberpunk future. Carnivon keeps ranting the whole while. At long last, he says, we come to the end of our miserable analog history. The long-awaited melding of man and mach Suddenly, a thick black coaxial cable wraps itself around his neck. This is not good. Um, look, I know that hacking is a thing that is supposed to happen, but uh, man doesn't meld well. Uh, agreed with you, Sleepy Wendy. Uh, I think violence is the answer to this one. We've got to do something, says Kelburn. You're damn right we do, you said. Not quite Bell Park's voice, but all right. Or I guess a different voice for Bell Park. Grab Chet's surfboard and bash that thing to death. Me? I don't even know how to surf. You don't need to know how to surf. You just need to know how to hit something with a surfboard. Okay, okay. He picks up the surfboard and holds it like a battering ram, then takes a deep breath and cries, Ah! He charges at the network station. But before he can even get within 10 feet, another giant spark shoots out of the router and knocks the surfboard clear out of his hands. It slams into the wall and breaks in half. I don't think I did it right, he says. Well spotted, Kelburn. So I guess we're going to do the hacking thing. Man, if I had known this, I would have had, like, um, new wave music. I assume a surfboard would be more of an insulator than a conductor, at least. Uh, true. You tug on Bitmap Zero's arms. Get in there and start hacking! Right, I'll go in remotely. She grabs one of her laptops and starts typing out commands furiously. Uh-oh. Uh-oh? This is bad. This is real bad. The code is all... Well, I don't even know. It's all tangled up. I've never seen a network this complex before. And the compression. I mean, this thing has gigabytes inside of its kilobytes. It's incredible. Can you hack it? You ask. I... Maybe? I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin. All of the indicator lights on the station turn red and start blinking in unison. 
as the cables tighten around Carnivon's neck. Come on, you say. You're the super hacker. Do something. <laughs> From chat, hack it with an EMP. There is one thing, she says, with a bit of creative rooting, I could bypass all of this upper level stuff and go straight down to the assembly code, start passing unsigned bits directly up the core subsystems with some truncated machine code. If we can direct enough microchips to start drawing power from incompatible buses, then we should be able to start frying the motor controls. The cables would go slack after that. Or I guess the computer could also explode. What? Look, it's risky, but it's all I can think of. Your call. You're not typing fast enough, says chat. Yes, I feel like this is something that Janelle Shea uh, generated from a trained neural network that she fed in a bunch of hacker lingo, um, you know, from hackers and um, from Lawnmower Man and from that CSI episode. Sure, let's let her pass unsigned bytes, uh, sorry, unsigned bits directly up the core system. It is still better than Criminal Minds. That is true. Sure, yeah, do it, you say. She starts typing out lines of code. How big an explosion are we talking, you ask. You might want to stand back. You take a few steps back. Okay, she says, here goes nothing. She shuts her eyes and presses the enter key. The lights on the front of the network station start blinking erratically, and little wisps of smoke come out of the main router. One by one, the cables that were holding Carnivon in place go limp. Finally, the last couple of them snap, and he slumps down to the ground. Yeah, is he okay? Kelburn rushes over to Carnivon's body. Is he alive? You ask. Uh, I think so, he says. I th think he's just unconscious. We need to get him to a hospital, though. <laughs> From chat, Daisy, Daisy. You feel a buzz in your pocket. Pretty sure my phone just came back on, you say. Mine too, says it's bitmap zero. I think you better call the police now, Mr. Kelburn. Right. Yes, of course, he says. Thank you, Bell. He takes out his phone and jogs out of the room. And I want my 20 bucks, you call after him. <laughs> so, says bitmap zero, what are we going to do about this murderous local... Local area network. Let's see, you say. You carefully crouch down in front of the tangle of wires. Feeling around a bit, you find the plug for the router and pull it out of the wall. After a couple of seconds, you plug it back in. The lights in the front start blinking normally. You stand up and dust off your hands. I think we're good. Yeah, sure, call the police. Yeah, the internet killed this blogger. Yeah, I guess this is before swatting was a thing. Uh, I like that you turned it off and back on again and potentially killed a sentient being. Good job, Bell Park. Youth detective. <laughs> and that is the end of the game. So we had a 12-year-old solve the murder in chat. Yes. Um, I really am curious as to what the cops are going to do when they show up. Um, so uh, I liked that. I, it's definitely a... Um, a lighter story uh, than some of Brendan's later works that I've I've played through. Um, there's, uh, it's interesting to me seeing it. Um, oh, that the the cops will involve a lot of swearing. Yes, agreed. Um, it's interesting to me because a lot of the aspects that I really like in Birdland and in Known Unknowns are here in earlier form. Um, I find it interesting when I encounter a creator later in their output to go back earlier and see what their works looked like. Um, and I had just missed this one, so it was nice to, to go back. Um, I felt like there was less control of tone and the shifts of tone than in Brendan's later works. Um, I really do recommend, um, especially known unknowns. I, I feel like I need to, on this stream at some point, go and do that one or Birdland. Um, just because they are are so good and have a lot of the really good qualities of this story, but then um, with much more emotional grounding than this. Uh, it's interesting to me to see what people do in terms of um, sort of periading uh, Encyclopedia Brown style stories. There was that um, one-off like super short story by Adam Cadre, uh, long ago that was Wikipedia Brown, where it's an Encyclopedia Brown where he's solving things, but then Bugs Meany keeps updating Wikipedia and rewriting it so that his knowledge is wrong, uh, which I, I really enjoyed. This seemed more like using the, taking the idea of a 12-year-old who wants to solve crimes 
um, and then amping that up and putting that into a new, uh, more incongruous um, situation. Because I suspect that her earlier jobs were all like solving who stole the lunch money or, you know, who toilet papered someone's house and now you get murder. Um, so there's some interesting mileage there. Um, but I don't think it was as controlled as I, I might have wanted for full effect. But still a lot of fun. Uh, definitely super, super goofy in a way that really pleased me. Um, and and uh, an interesting change from last week where we went through Heretic's Hope um, that was much more emotionally fraught and dense uh, and a very different in tone and effect. And with that, I will wrap it up. Thanks again. Uh, folks who were with me in chat. Uh, I always enjoy doing this. Um, Sleepy Wendy, thanks especially for your inputs, and I'm glad that you enjoyed the narration. And for those of you uh, watching at a later time, come join me on Saturdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. Um, I really enjoy going through these, and I always enjoy getting to share them with you. Uh, thanks again. Have a great time. <laughs>